in your Bibles tonight, the book of Acts, chapter number 13. We're working our way through this passage of Scripture, and when we come to Acts chapter number 13, we have the first time that a church really sends a group of missionaries out to a foreign field. It's the actual beginning of going to the uttermost part of the earth, as recorded in the book of Acts. There's so many things we can learn here, and generally when I preach a passage of Scripture, I kind of like to put it in a package and uh, emphasize something specific. But I feel led of the Lord to work our way through this passage of Scripture. And there's so many uh, things that can be brought out and emphasized. And I'm just asking the Lord to share some things with you that He has shared with me as I've prepared this passage of Scripture. And we'll read together the first 13 verses of Acts chapter 13 together tonight. The Bible says in verse number 1, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaean, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the isle of, unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. And Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety, and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now, when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. And so we have this passage of Scripture. Uh, really, I can see uh, two or three sections here in this passage of Scripture. And we'll just look at this, the first three verses. We see a picture of the church at Antioch. And in the church of Antioch, there's a group, a very diverse group of people who are serving the Lord. And the church at Antioch has a burden and develops a burden for missions. And they're praying and seeking God's will and fasting. And they become spiritual people. And spiritual people become people who are interested in evangelism. And so they become burdened to share the gospel. And God's working and the Holy Ghost calls out of their midst uh, two specific people to go and begin this first missionary trip and missionary journey and missionary work. We see Bar Barnabas and Saul, who we know as Paul, come out of this group. And so the Holy Ghost sends them forth and they begin their travels. They preach in the synagogues. They preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you won't believe this. They're trying to do something good for the glory of God and they run into trouble. Isn't that something? We have this idea sometimes, and I'm afraid that there are preachers who want to present this idea. They want so badly to have some type of convert to their faith that they forget to tell the whole truth. If you're a faithful Christian, that does not mean that you have a life without issue. If you're a faithful Christian, that does not mean that your bank accounts flourish automatically. If you're a faithful Christian, that does not mean that You've said yes to Jesus and bye to all trouble and difficulty. As a matter of fact, if you were to hear the testimony of all the apostles and the church planters 
from the New Testament church here at Antioch, they would testify not to a bed of roses and a life of ease, but they would testify to the faithfulness and the glory of God. They would testify to the peace of God that passes understanding, the grace of God that meets them at every turn, but they would not testify to a life that was full of ease. As a matter of fact, there's never been anything more rotten than a Christian or a person who's never had any difficulty. If you look back over your life, it's the difficulty that causes you to trust in the Lord. It's the difficulty that gives you a sense of compassion and patience. It's the difficulty that gives you faith in God to meet your needs. Oh, I'm thankful for trouble. That's why Paul said, I would rather glory in afflictions. It wasn't because he was, had lost his ever-living mind. He had just learned to glory in afflictions because he knew every time I have an affliction, I have a God that has grace and mercy and peace and ability far above my affliction. So he said, I'm just going to glory in them from now on. Hallelujah. That's a glory in afflictions because it proves how faithful God is. And so we have this, this scripture and the John, I mean Barnabas and Saul, they go on this missionary journey, Paul, and they begin, and they're beginning to have an opportunity to witness to a man named Sergius Paulus. Sergius Paulus, is, the Bible says, is a deputy. He's somebody that's got some authority in this area. And Sergius Paulus was, was, uh, Paulus was with this other guy who we know now as Elymas or Bar-Jesus. It's the same guy, but he's a sorcerer. The Bible says about this sorcerer that he is, he's trying his best to prevent this man, the deputy, from becoming a follower of Christ. But the deputy has called on Barnabas and Saul to tell them the, tell them the word of God. And so there's a confrontation, there's a problem. The Bible says that Saul, Paul, full of the Holy Ghost... He just calls him out and deals with the problem. And after he's dealt with the problem and God works a miracle, this deputy puts his trust in Jesus, follows the Lord, and then we see Barnabas and Saul moving on to the next place. Moving on to the next opportunity. And as we conclude this passage of Scripture, it, verse 13, we have the last verse of verse 13. The Bible says, John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. And here we see at the very conclusion of the story, we see John Mark. He wimps out and says, I'm going back to the house. And so in this story, there's so many different variables. There's a lot of things I want to share with you. As we look at this passage of Scripture, we consider missionaries and missions in the local church and God's word regarding missionary work let's look together so we begin this past scripture verse number one the bible says now there were in the church that was at antioch certain prophets and teachers now we're looking here at the church at antioch and the bible just wants us to get a a good glimpse into the church at antioch now previous to acts chapter 13 the church that gets the most attention in the book of acts is the church at jerusalem and I'm not going to put a cloud of darkness necessarily over the church at Jerusalem, but I want you to know something about the church at Jerusalem. The church at Jerusalem it will show up another time in, the, in our study in the, book, in, the, in the book of Acts, but the church at Jerusalem, they are the people who get hard-nosed against the gospel going to the utmost, uttermost parts of the earth. They become staunch against and they're really aggravated at the idea that these rotten, dirty Gentiles are receiving Jesus by faith as Savior. They're not liking that. They kind of like the old way. They kind of like the, the uh, they kind of like when it's just them, it's their few and no more. And so the church at Jerusalem, it's almost like they begin to fade away a little bit and the church at Antioch rises to the scene and God is beginning to work and use this church at Antioch. And the church at Antioch says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to obey the Lord. We're going to honor the Lord. They're spiritual, seeking God. And God impresses on the heart of the church to do their part to evangelize the world. I was reading a history of a church today. Uh, 
And I was fascinated. The name of the church was, it had evangelical in it. And I happened to be somewhat familiar with the church, and I thought to myself, my lands, it may have used to been evangelical, and meaning that they are willing to evangelize, because quite frankly, the church doesn't have an evangelical spark in it anymore. And then I study this, and I look at this passage of Scripture, and I see the church at Antioch. When the church at Antioch has, is uh, fasting and praying and seeking the Lord and ministering to the Lord, guess what happens? God stirs in the heart of a church that is centering on God's Word and God's will and desiring to honor and please the Lord with their ministry and not just please themselves or please their little area or play church. This church that is desiring to know and do God's will, guess what God impresses on their heart to do? To send the best they have to the uttermost part of the earth. And I'll just have you know something. A testimony of a Christ-honoring church is a church that has a burden to reach the lost and reach the world. The church at Antioch. In the church at Antioch, I want you to see who's there. It's fascinating to me. Now there were in the church at, that was at Antioch, verse number 1, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas. We know Barnabas. I've preached about Barnabas recently. He was an encourager. What a blessing Barnabas was. And Simeon, that was called Niger. Now most likely, Simeon was a, an African man. Most people believe that he was a black man. And Simeon was... This man they called Niger, and Simeon was possibly the Simeon that carried Christ's cross. Remember that? There's a lot of folks who want to say yes, a lot of folks who want to say no, and I'm going to say, I don't know. But it's possible. But we know Simeon is here, and Simeon was called Niger. So we've got a guy, Barnabas. And Barnabas has been serving the Lord for some time now, and God has really used Barnabas. Then we've got this man, Simeon, that was called Niger, and he's most likely this African man that is of a different nationality and culture. Then we have Lucius of Cyrene, and we have Manaean. Now, Manaean is quite an interesting guy. We don't know much about Lucius of Cyrene. Uh, he was from Cyrene, that's all we know. But when you look at Manaean, look how the Bible describes Manaean. The Bible says Manaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Uh, who was Manaean? Who was Herod the Tetrarch? Let's start there. Herod the Tetrarch is the man who commanded that John the Baptist's head would be taken off after that little lady had done a dance for him and asked for half the kingdom or anything she wanted. That's Herod. So Herod's buddy, when they were kids growing up, is a man named Manaean. Manaean was a boy that was most likely raised in prominence, someone who had been around the Herod, someone who had been in some type of authority, but God had saved Manaean. And in the church at Antioch, God was using a guy named Manaean. And so we see, <coughs> we see people from all kinds of backgrounds. We see the Simeon that possibly stood on the road just witnessing what happened when Jesus was carried out there and carried the cross for Christ. Somebody that a Roman soldier would not have been uh, embarrassed or shy. Somebody that would probably have been wearing peasant clothing who said, carry that cross, and Simeon carried that cross. And then you see a Manaean who had been raised with Herod. You see uh, Barnabas who had some wealth and had been in the church for a long time. And what we see is we see a cross-section of people from, of different ages and backgrounds, and it represents the church. You don't know how to tell if a church is healthy? If a church is healthy, it's like a body. It has its parts. Church is healthy when there's babies and children, and teens and young adults and adults and middle-aged adults and getting older adults and getting older than that adults. And real old adults. A church that's having funerals and having birthday parties. A church that's having weddings and wedding showers. A church that's having baby showers. That's that sign of a healthy church. I hear people talk, oh, I wish we could do something to attract the youth. Now look, I don't want to run the youth away. But the key to having a healthy church 
is to emphasize the truth of God's Word. And when God's Word is what you feed on and God's Word is what you feed the people, then God's Word is what brings people and raises up a healthy body, a healthy organism. And so I praise the Lord for a healthy church and to God be all the glory. But here's what was going on in the church at Antioch. This healthy church had a cross-section of all kinds of people. And God was working in their midst. And there were people who not only were attending, but they were rising to the top. Folks who had become preachers and teachers and faithful servants of the Lord. And God says, let me tell you about the church at Antioch. And finally, he concludes in verse 1 with the man Saul. Saul was part of that church. What a miracle story Saul was. Can you imagine? Here's a friend, Manet, and a friend of Herod who decapitated John the Baptist. And here's Saul also who'd been guilty of martyring the church, but God had revolutionized and changed his life. And out of that bag of even potentially deplorable people came a group of folks that God would raise up to share the gospel and see the church and the word of God and churches planted all over the world and we're a product of it. That's wonderful. I like the way it looks. And it works because God was in it. And Saul, there's old Saul. God's going to use him in a mighty way. Look at the Bible says in verse number 2. As they ministered to the Lord. As they ministered to the Lord. Now this is so important to me. As they ministered to the Lord. Now we're going to get to what happened. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost separated and called Barnabas and Saul to be missionaries. But when did that happen? It was as they ministered to the Lord that God blessed and used their church. Their burden was ministering to the Lord. Now this is something we've got to pay attention to. The scripture says, as they ministered to the Lord. Who were they ministering to? The Lord. Now look, there's a place for ministering to the poor, and we should. There's a place for ministering to the needs of humanity, and we should. There's a place to ministering to this aid and this thing and this benevolent situation, and we should and we do. But I want you to know something, that if ministering to the needs of humanity becomes the primary focus of the church, then a church no longer is a church in God's eyes, and that church will not be a healthy living organism and that church will not be what God has called them to do and the church was doing the right thing they were ministering to the Lord the main focus should be ministering to the Lord how do we minister to the Lord to obey the Bible says is better than to sacrifice and as we obey God and his word guess what happens God uses us to minister to the Lord and minister to people I'm ashamed to think that a lot of things that are done in the name of Jesus and work that's done in the name of Jesus is just efforts spent to make this world a better place from which to go to hell. We cannot leave the gospel message out. We cannot leave the emphasis of the Lord Jesus. And as you study the Bible, guess what shows up over and over again? Man is sinner. Jesus is Savior, and the good news is you can have everlasting life through faith in Christ who paid the price for your sins. The Bible from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation presents this gospel truth that there is hope for the lost, and we're all lost until we receive Christ by faith as our Savior. So this church, what were they doing? They were ministering to the Lord, and they fasted. Fasting is a wonderful practice. If you are fa fasting, don't tell me because you're not supposed to say. It's not supposed to show up on your face. Oh, oh. You're not supposed to whine about it. But there should be seasons where we fast and pray. It's a season where we intentionally seek the Lord. We give up something in our seeking for the Lord, primarily food. Oh, man, that's rough, ain't it? Fasting was a sign and it was, it was representative of the fact that this church, the church at Antioch, you know what they wanted? Why would you fast and pray? Because you want to know and do God's will. 
because you want clarity from heaven on God's purpose for your life and the next step and the next move and the next thing that God would like for you to invest in. So as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Bible says, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. The Holy Ghost of God speaks to the heart of the people at the church. And they said, we need to send people to serve God. God's made it clear to us that he's, going to call, he's calling out of our midst Barnabas. And so how many of you ever heard people talk about being called to preach? Being called to preach. I like the thought. I understand the principle. But sometimes you can uh, use your Christian uh, language and folks who've not been around church don't understand what you're talking about. I've looked at folks who said, God called me to preach. And they're like, on the phone? <laughs> you got to tell me more about this. <laughs> but there is a calling. And God does call people to serve him. And God, if you'll let him, he'll call you to serve him. Some people, you say, say God will call you and to serve him. To, God will call you to a task. God will call you to a ministry. You say that to people, and they're like, oh, my lands, that's scary. I'm scared to death God's going to call me to Africa. <laughs> well, if he does, it'll be wonderful. Chances are he won't. But if he does, that'll be wonderful. But God's calling. How many of you are willing to answer God's call? Don't raise your hand, but in your heart answer yes or no. Now, look, if you're qualified and God calls you to preach, you ought to be a preacher. If God calls you to be a missionary, you ought to be willing to be a missionary. If God calls you to be a Sunday school teacher, nursery worker, a faithful witness at work, you know, there are some things that God calls us to, and it's just automatic. If you're a husband or wife, God's called you to be a godly husband or a wife. And if you're not being that, then you are missing God's calling in your life. And you are not only shorting your family, but you're shorting yourself of the blessings that God has prepared for you. The Holy Ghost of God, when they fasted the church in Antioch, they prayed. And the Holy Ghost said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I've called them. God called me to preach. One preacher said it was like this. I knew God called me to preach. I woke up one day craving chicken and didn't want to go to work. <laughs> Some of you are still getting it. That wasn't me. But God did call me to preach. God put the burden in my heart to be a preacher. Uh, God put the burn in my heart to serve him. I'll tell you one thing that just rang loud and clear in my heart when God called me to preach was if the gospel is true and the word of God is true, and I knew that it was because Jesus had changed my life when I got saved at eight years old and had continued to bless and encourage me. If the gospel's true and real people are going to die and go to heaven because they've heard the gospel and received Jesus by faith as their Savior. And if the gospel's true and real people are going to go to hell because they have not heard the gospel and received Christ by faith as Savior, I thought to myself, I probably ought to preach. If that's what the Lord would have me do, I probably ought to preach. And God put it in my heart. The first thing I remember is I surrendered to the Lord. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know anything about preaching. But I surrendered to the Lord to be willing to do anything he wanted me to do. Somebody encouraged me to do that at church camp. And I did. I said, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. By the way, every last one of us should openly to the Lord declare ourselves open and willing to do anything that he'd have us to do. I'll just tell you, if you refuse to open yourself up to do whatever God's will is for your life, you are closing the greatest door of blessing that you could ever have. We get the devil sells you a lie. He sells you a bill of goods. If God caught you, get scared. You think, oh, God will call me to Africa. God will call me to preach. And I don't want to do either one. And good chance is if that's not what you want to do, that's probably not what God's going to call you to. Because he's made you a specific way to do his will.
But I'll just have you know something. The devil wants to sell you a bill of goods, and he wants you to close the door to the will of God for your life. But you should begin your day. You should begin your week. You should start right now saying, Lord, here's the door of my life. I am open to do your will, whatever that is. And when God called me to preach, it began there. I said, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Before you knew it, it was, became more and more clear. I had a desire to tell people about Jesus. I had a desire to know more about God's Word. First time I ever got up and preached at a nursing home, it was so fun. Buddy, uh, Buddy had, uh, had a nursing home ministry out on the West End. And uh, he invited me. I just surrendered a call to preach. The only time I'd ever kind of preached before that is the night I surrendered a call to preach, I preached in dorm devotions at, the, at church camp. I was an assistant counselor with Paul Grinstead at, uh, in Beattyville, Kentucky. And I, he said, do you want to preach? I said, well, sure, I guess I'll preach. I, I didn't know how to preach. I had sang this song, Shepherd Boy, before about the life of David. So I just preached the words of that song. Instead of singing it, I just said them in a preacher-type voice. And there was my first message, you know. <laughs> I tried to do it with sincerity. The next time I preached, Buddy said, won't you come preach at the nursing home? I'm going to be gone in two weeks. I said, well, okay, I will. So that I said, here's the deal. I said, I'll preach the week you're gone, but I'm going to go with you this week so I can see what happens. And so I did. I went with him. And he preached a message. I can't remember exactly what it was, but he preached, he preached a message from a text of Scripture, and I took a few notes down. So the next Sunday, I go back to the nursing home. You know what I preached? Exactly what Buddy preached the week before. <laughs> but I was encouraged to preach, and I started preaching at Valley Nursing Home. And every week, I'd go to Valley Nursing Home. I'd lay out a Pete Sunday School class and go preach at Valley Nursing Home. And, man, I loved it. They'd let me preach if I'd sing a little bit. Learned how to preach with cats doing figure eights around your legs at the nursing home. That was exciting. But God called me to preach. And it's been something I've never not wanted to do. It was God's will. But I'll just have you know that whatever God calls you to is going to be right. It's going to be best. And you need to be willing to do whatever God called you to do. And this is what happened to the church. God called them. The Bible says in verse 3, When they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. What happened here? This is an interesting thing. Have you ever wondered why we do ordination services? This is one of the reasons why. Now, ordination... We don't have a lot. We don't have any extra power. And we do have authority as a local church. God's given the church authority, and the church sends people to the mission field and sends people to preach. And so we do have authority, and so we have ordination. We question folks and find out their doctrine sound. And then we gather together and we lay hands on them. I want you to know something. When you lay hands on somebody, there's not some extra special power that's imparted from the hand of a deacon. If you know deacons, you know that's not true. If you know pastors, you know that's not true. I am one. I love this church. The preacher ain't much. It's not an impartation of any type of power, but really it's a group of people who are doing the best they can, who've said yes to God's will to the best they know how. They lay their hands on it and say, we identify with you. A lot of times I think New Testament laying on of hands looked more like, come here, buddy, I'm praying for you. This is going to be good. I'm with you. I'm standing with you. And they laid hands on one another, and they prayed, and they said, here, we're going to trust you. The Bible says in verse 4, So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues. Of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. God sent them. The Bible says, They being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. Folks, I want you to know something. If God sends you to do something, if God calls you to do something, what shortage are you going to have? None. You see, that's what's so exciting about being willing to do God's will. 
to answer God's calling in your life. I'm not saying God's going to call you to the mission field or to pastor a church. But I am saying God is going to call you to serve him. God's going to call you to serve him where you are. God's going to call, call you to win the loss. God's going to call you to himself, to his purpose. And if God calls you and God sends you, what shortage are you going to have? I'll tell you, being a husband is the most important thing in my life. Being a father is of utmost importance to me. Being a friend, being a pastor, these things are so important. And I'll tell you, I don't want to fail. You know how we can have the confidence, God's blessing, in the midst of God's calling? Is if we'll just humble ourselves and be the father God called us to be, and the husband God called us to be, and the friend that God calls us to be, and the pastor God calls us, called us to be, and we'll submit ourselves to God's will and open ourselves up to his calling, then the Bible says not only will he call you to his work, He'll send you to his work. And if God sent you to do it, what shortage will you ever have? Isn't it wonderful to be a child of God? I didn't get near as far as I'd hoped to. And that's okay. That's okay. What a wonderful passage of Scripture. I want to encourage you to do something. God is calling you. I, I've heard so many times, and I'm not reprimanding anyone. Is God calling you? And we often mean preach and I'll tell you God may be calling you to preach if he is I'm going to rejoice with you well here is God calling you to preach is God calling you to be a missionary is God calling you to full time Christian service we've heard those things and they're good and fine I'm not going to say ask the question is God calling you I'm just going to say tonight God is calling you God is calling you. And if you'll seek the Lord, he'll show you what he's calling you to. And when you answer his calling in your life, he will send you forth with his unction and power and blessing. And you're going to see fruit because God produces fruit in the lives of surrendered Christians.